right, HTC, how you doing today? Good to see you. Good especially to see you. Thanks for kind of braving our wild weather this weekend. We'll kind of see how things go. I was grateful to see that kind of the worst of what we expect is later on this afternoon. So again, be thoughtful and be safe. Our desert does not do well with water. And uh, so hopefully it's a, a good thing that kind of passes by. I want to welcome you guys here in Powell. For those of you guys joining in Hesperia at our campus there, I want to welcome you today. For those in Apple Valley, a big welcome to you as well. And as you've heard and saw in the video, we are in this series, part three, uh, trying to get an understanding, the foundations for, God, what is your design for what you've built within us, our sexuality? And as we're looking at that every week, the goal of this series is just to help us echo back what God's word has told us very clearly and, and really timeless in terms of, even though our world seems to be changing rapidly, the reality of God's design is unchanging. And we wanna become very familiar with that so we can understand anything else as a counterfeit and how we respond to that is really just biblically informed. That's really been our goal. And we realize that because God designed our sexuality, it makes it a holy sexuality. It comes from him and is to be according to his design. And as our series is, is titled, it also reminds us because it's such a powerful thing we are indeed needing to handle it with care. So I'm really glad that you're here with us today. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring this part of our series today, the teaching aspect. We'll finish up with this today, but then the next two weeks before we close out, we're gonna have some great conversations with people from our church family who have seen God redeem some powerful things, though sexuality was not according to his design in their lives. And I'll let you, let you hear their story and let you hear what God has both redeemed and is continuing to redeem in and through them. So I'm real excited about how we're gonna wrap it all up together before we move on. So um, as we dial in today, what I am most interested in is a lie that our culture continues to, to share, but I think sadly we've bought in at the church, and not just HDC, but church level as well, Big C Church. And it's simply this, that the most important thing about us, the thing that defines us, is who we're sexually attracted to, our sexual orientation, as it were. And that's more important than anything else. I'm just gonna tell you from God's word, that is not the truth. And what we do is we wanna come back to then what is, what's the most important thing about our identity? And it's this reality that we were made to bear the image of God. And I wanna talk about that today and unpack that for us. Uh, very typical to every week in our series, we're gonna start on page one. So if you have a Bible, if you'd make your way to Genesis one, that's where we're gonna begin. And I hope that you're seeing this thread that's running through the incredible importance of Genesis one, two, and three. They are foundational for us understanding who we are. They're foundational for us understanding whose we are. And they're foundational for us to understand how we're called to live in a world that's broken and in a world that God still is redeeming. And so I'm excited to dial that in with you. If you have your notes today, have those ready as well. And we'll start with number one. In your notes, you and every person you come in contact with is an image bearer of God. You and every single human being you come in contact with is an image bearer of God. We pick it up in Genesis 1, verse 26. It says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all of the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. <clears throat> so we see these fun, fundamental foundational verses from Genesis 1. We've looked at them every week in our series. And what we take away from it this week is the intentional design of being created in the image of God. Throughout the creation account, there is no other being, there is no other thing that is likened to this idea of being made in the image of God. No other animal, no other plant, no other anything uniquely to us, humanity made in his image. 
So when we take that, we have to realize there's something about that. There's a deep sense of meaning and worth that comes to the light, to light. And we even see that within that idea of being an image bearer, you even see the role of giving leadership, giving dominion to all of the created order. All of that is intrinsic in that design. We were talking about that a little bit this week in our teaching team meeting and discussed the idea of what what does that idea of an image bearer mean? And I appreciate Pastor Kurt. He had this idea that maybe one of the better illustrations of this idea is that of a mirror. And a mirror is interesting. On the one hand, I look at it and I go, praise God that it's not literal, that God looks like this. So that's not true. But when you see it, you realize it's giving a reflection of, of an image, it's, it can never encompass the totality. Even if you have a full-size mirror in your home and wanna check out the whole fit before you walk out, even that doesn't represent all of what you're looking back at. It's just a one-dimensional reflection of a much more complicated being. And I thought that's a great way to put it. We don't mirror back, reflect back all that God is but we do reflect aspects of his character and aspects of his nature. And so this is what it meant. Adam and Eve, the first man, first woman, created in the image to reflect back the character and nature of God. And this is really important that we understand this from the beginning because then what we understand is we look at our world today and we go, you know what? If if that's what God's design was in this perfect environment, We also realize that the story doesn't end at Genesis one and two, but it quickly moves to chapter three. And so with this fall, sin enters into the world, sin and death. And as a result, the key question is now that we live on this side of the fall, what is still true of us related to being image bearers? What is still true about what we are to reflect with the character and nature of God? And maybe then this is what is a better illustration of where we're at today. Already we saw that a mirror can only reflect an aspect of who we are, just simply what you can see from the front. But the reality is then we even realize a broken mirror all the more reflects only pieces and fragments of even what that could initially. And this is the result of the fall is that we have this brokenness in us. And and, and what was more a design, more part of God's clarity of who he was is now in a shattered reality. But here's the thing I want you to be mindful of. Shattered or not, we still, even in broken ways, reflect the image, the character, the nature of who God is. And simply by being a human being created with that likeness, you have an, you have an inherent value and worth far above any other thing in creation. Now that's not only true of you, but it's true of every human being you come in contact with. And there's a tension, right? Even though we're not the image bearers we were initially created to be, we still bear something of the image, something of the essence, something of the nature of who God is. And and when we see that and when we reflect that, we process God, there's still, no matter how far away someone may be from walking in God's design in all areas of their life, they still bear this capacity to reflect his character and his essence. And in the tension of our brokenness, sometimes we can discard what God values and what God loves. So today as we kick this time off, I wanna begin to go back to when you see a person. This is what helped me so much in the summer of 2020, when it felt like the world was falling apart and there was so much hatred, there was so much division If you aren't as mad about my cause as I am, you're a part of the problem. And so as I just started receiving these messages, whether secondhand through social media or literally in my face or via email, God was just so good to keep reminding me, Todd, these are fellow image bearers of God, loved and valued by me simply because they bear my likeness. Now, what they may be doing or saying right now looks very different from who God is, but they intrinsically have value. And that's something that I have to keep coming back with and it helps me continue to see people when I wanna see an enemy. 
When I want to see someone that I'm frustrated with and just want to lash out against, I'm reminded, God, you have an intrinsic value and love for them. And we go back to what happened. This, this reality of, of the pollution of our lives began long before any of us showed up. One of the authors that's on our resource list is Christopher Yuan. He has this great quote about what happened when original sin came into the process. He says this, original sin is the sinful state and condition in which every person is born. I know, by the way, when you hear that, There's a messaging in our world today that talks about people being not just inherently valuable, like I've said, image bearers of God, but inherently good. Original sin would say, no, something different, inherently in a state of sin. In other words, we have a polluted nature. It means that our nature has been corrupted by sin, a condition that produces only more sin. So though we are created in the image of God, there is a brokenness that isn't just once, but it keeps on repeating itself. And so we live in this tension of how to process those realities. By the way, our resource list, I have said, is probably the most valuable ongoing thing that will come out of this series. And I would just encourage you again, if you haven't already, text the word laundry to 64567. And when you do, what's gonna come right back to you is that resource list. These are two of the books today, Christopher Yuan's Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, and a book I'll refer to later today, Todd Wilson's Mere Sexuality. So these are great, and we've said before, some of us say, Todd, me and reading don't go well together. Like, I just don't do a lot of reading. Well, one of the things we did for most of the authors on our list is introduce you to them via a podcast, 25 minutes long, or an article that you could read in 10 or 15. And we thought that's at least a way to get familiar a little bit with some of these um, authors that we think have so much to offer on these topics of God's design for our sexuality. So if this is true, that there's a a, a thing within us that God has built, but that initially in creation, but then has been marred in the fall, as we are to value people, we also recognize the inherent brokenness they bring to the table, just like you and I do. And here's where it begins to go wrong. In your notes, we mistake our God-given identity as image bearers when we replace it with anything different in that space. We mistake our God-given identity as image bearers when we replace it with anything different in that space. My first role in ministry was as a youth pastor in the other desert over in Lancaster. And I'll never forget, I had some really squirrely junior high boys. And some would just say, Todd, you're being redundant. Every junior high boy is squirrely. And like, that's probably true. But I had some really squirrely junior high boys that I was having a problem with. They were being very distracting when we were having our kind of youth group uh, time together. So I remember pulling them aside one time and just kind of getting down and looking at them going, hey, this is just not clicking. Like there's times I need you to to be focused and be connecting with us rather than messing around. And I remember I said, just help me get to know you better. What are you about? And I remember one of them just kind of looking me dead in the eye and saying, dude, I'm a snowboarder. And this is from like a seventh grade kid who lives in the desert. And I go, so awesome. So your definition is what you do maybe two or three months a year. Cool. And as as funny as that may be, it's not funny when we think about what we insert in that space. I may, based on my career, I define myself based on my marital status, a husband, a wife, or even being single. I begin to define myself by aspects of maybe my parenthood, I'm a mom or a dad. I begin to define myself by achievements. I begin to define myself by failures. Whatever I insert in that rightful place as image bearer of God, when I begin to do that, the rest of the equation goes bad. Watch, including my sexual attraction. When I think that's what defines me most, I've got real problems because everything that spins out of that equation continues to go wrong. I looked it up this week doing some homework, getting ready for our time together. 
And in it, just did a basic Google search definition of the phrase sexual orientation. This is what pops up first. It is commonly defined as, watch, a person's identity. A person's identity in relation to the gender or genders to which they're sexually attracted. When we buy into the lie of sexual orientation, what we're saying is the thing that matters most about that person, the thing that matters most about me is who I'm sexually attracted to. I'm here to tell you today from God's word, the most important part of you, the thing that defines you most significantly is you are made to bear and reflect the image of God. Broken as you may be, broken as I am. You are not who you're attracted to. You are loved, you are valued in, in a created being who is made to reflect your creator to your world. And what I wanna see today is what happens when that goes wrong. Number two in your notes, sin has caused us to be confused. Sin has caused us to be confused about our own identity and the identity of others. Sin has caused us to be confused about who we are and who everyone else is. The passage to me that we haven't gotten into in this series, but would be totally remiss if we did not is Romans 1. If you have your Bible, you can scoot there from Genesis 1 to Romans 1. Romans is the sixth book, excuse me, in the New Testament. And as you find your way there, Paul is building a case to demonstrate the incredible need for, but the incredible amazing reality of the gospel. And that every single human being is in need of redemption, in need of rescue from judgment and condemnation. And the good news is God provided the way. But as he's building the case in chapter one, I want you to watch a slide with me. I want you to watch gravity take hold. And when a people reject God in his rightful place as not just creator, but the authority over their lives, we see the equation continue to go wrong all the way through. We pick it up in verse 21 of chapter one. For although they knew God, and by the way, the first verses, beginning of verse 18 leading up to this, Paul makes a case that all of the created order screams that there's a creator. So that's what he's alluding alluding to. They, They have no excuse to not recognize that there's a being who's put this all in motion. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Note the word images. We've been created in the image of God. Image bearers exchanged our value and worth to follow after, to worship created images, made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. What I want you to grab about this as we look back in this passage, I want you to know all of the active verbs because these are things that are actively being chosen. It begins, people actively dismiss God from their lives. They neither glorified him, meaning they didn't recognize his value and role of authority, and they also failed to give him thanks. And there was a consequence for that, futile thinking and darkened foolish hearts. They claimed to be wise, but instead walked in foolishness. As they exchanged the glory of the almighty God, as they focused away from the creator to the creation, this is huge because what happens is as image bearers made to reflect the image of God, we began to worship. We began to focus upon things that he had created who were even below us in terms of value and worth, but instead of focusing our attention on who God rightfully is. And this becomes, at the beginning of this part of Romans one, becomes the headwaters for all kinds of distortions of God's design moving down. This is where we pick it up, verse 24. Therefore, and that word when we see it in the Bible, we always ask, what's it there for? It's a summary statement. In light of all that I've just said, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things 
rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Note again the active statements. Initially we had, and they dismiss God from his rightful place in their lives. Now we see, and God gave them over. As a good parent puts up guardrails for his children to live between, now God says, if this is how you're going to have it, if this is how you're going to walk, I'm gonna take the guardrails away and let you go about it. Let you have your way. Notice this is an active statement. It doesn't passively happen. God pulls back and allows people to live as they want. And you'll note that one of the very first realities of God giving them over is sexual impurity. We talked last weekend about God's design for sex. We talked about the beautiful gift that God intended it to be between a man and a woman in the covenant of lifelong marriage and how it was actually something that brings people together in a oneness relationship like nothing else can. This is not that. And so it begins by dismissing God's design and choosing to live their own way. You'll note at the end, it says a powerful thing. It says, and they exchange the truth for the lie. Remember we said a couple weeks ago, the breakdown begins when we begin to put the pronoun in front of truth begin to call it my truth or your truth rather than my opinion and your perspective because there's only one truth. And in this reality is exchange truth. Now every lie becomes viable. And what you'll note is it said that they exchange their worship See, one thing that we think, sometimes we have a very narrowly defined understanding of worship as though it's what you did the first 20 minutes when you walked into the service today. You worshiped. But you'll note that the Bible gives a much more fuller understanding. And, and I love to use this phrase when I'm trying to get my head around, what does the Bible define worship as? And the phrase that I use is that which I'm preoccupied with. That which I think upon when no one is making me do it, that which I behave towards because I have this predisposition to have this in my head and in my heart and in my actions. And so this is a powerful thing that's good for us to know in your notes. All people everywhere are worshipers. All people everywhere are worshipers. The only question is of what or whom. And in this case, in this degradation, this sliding down of gravity, Paul notes that instead of being preoccupied with their creator, instead people became preoccupied with themselves, with their own bodies. And that is the, the challenge that being outside of God's design for sex, we begin to worship the actual experience and the actual body of someone else rather than, rightly so, our affections and our focus being upon our creator. So this is what's happening. Paul's kind of giving almost a sequential reality. And I want you to note that at the headwaters are idolatry and then very quickly sexual immorality. We begin living outside of God's design. It continues. Verse 26. Because of this, Another active statement, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Notice then this slide is going down. I want you to note as we see this, that you'll note that the idea of same sex attraction and same sex behavior doesn't just come out of nowhere. And it's not as though the Bible just kind of puts a neon light over it. You'll see it's part of a continuous turning away from God's design. And in this next sequence of what happens, we see that there's a few things that goes again to God actively giving people over Do as you please. You have been doing so. I'm taking off the guardrails. But you'll note as a result, it began with the degradation of their bodies with sexuality outside of God's design in terms of a man and a woman in a covenant marriage. Now it goes to another level of an unnatural design. Not just outside of God's 
commitment and covenant of marriage, but now man with man, woman with woman, and the design breaks down to another level. When we process this idea of realizing that it's not according to God's not only covenantal design, but even biological design, it results in subsequent penalty or punishment. Now, this isn't the only passage in the Bible related to same-sex attraction and behavior. It's simply one of many. But in it, what I wanted you to see is that it's part of a bigger picture. And there's even much more to read that we're gonna get to in just a moment. But it's in there at the headwaters of when things begin to break down and as people live according to their design and not God's. One of the things that I wanted to share with you though, I think she so powerfully articulates, she shares Rosaria uh, Champagne Butterfield is another author on our resource list. Her story is so powerful. She had lived as an adult, her whole adult life as a lesbian, and then she, as a professor in a university, and then she comes in contact with a pastor and his wife. She is in their oikos, and they love her amazingly. And it's their hospitality and their love that begins to plant seeds for the gospel. And Rosaria ultimately ends up coming and laying her feet at, at, at the foot of, laying her life at the foot of the cross and responding to the gospel. And now as a believer, she writes of this powerful thing you've just read in this first part of Romans one, see the way it devolves. She writes, don't miss this progression. The first exchange is glory for corruption. The second is truth for lies. And the third is natural relations that are life-giving to unnatural relations that are death-producing. These three exchanges serve as a parallel to the three kinds of sin that capture our hearts. So look at what she's doing. She's creating parallels. And see the first one, original sin. It leaves us the way we were all born with a desire for that which God hates. We just want the things that we shouldn't want. Actual sin hardens our heart and darkens our soul with each transgression. The more we keep walking away from God's design, the more we like it. But then this third one, indwelling sin, traps us into thinking. And note, she's saying this is not how we ought to think, but we begin to think that we cannot mortify a sin that dwells within us because this sin is indistinguishable from who we are. Our new identity, the thing that defines us most, is the sin that is so enmeshed with the way that we're living every day. She plays that out so well, I think, in just such a powerful just demonstration of these three things and how they parallel. I want to say this. I believe that the Big C Church, not necessarily HDC, but the Big C Church has gotten a lot of things wrong about the way that we understand and the way that we respond to same-sex attraction and behavior. And I think that it's true for a couple of reasons. A, A way that we've kind of put it in its own category. This is a type of sin that God's really gonna judge. This is a type of sin that's really against his design. And you'll note last week when we walked through the original versus counterfeits, all the different examples of heterosexual sin outside of God's design just as much as same-sex behavior. But I think one of the reasons, there's maybe two, that we have done this thing subtly or very openly is number one, I think it relates back to the idea that as you process this kind of sin and think about people, you begin to think of individuals connected to the big political machine. To this idea that every person that you meet who's living in a same-sex lifestyle is representative or is all about the same media and the same political power that you feel jammed in your face, hence Pride Month two months ago. And as a result, it kind of inflames this frustration almost more than other types of sinful behaviors and lifestyles because you're just done with it. Like, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to see it anymore. And it actually, every same-sex attracted person you come across, you put in that category, that's the stereotype. They're pushing that same agenda. One of the things that I found to be so helpful for me Years ago, I came to the understanding that same-sex attraction and behavior is no different than any other deviation from God's design. 
but I was starting to get influenced by the political or media machine and de developing a degree of frustration as well. And one of the authors on our resource list, his name is Mark Yarhouse. I had the privilege of hearing Mark a couple of times and one of the things he helped me with, and understand who Mark is, he is an academic. He has spent much time, he's well regarded in the community of all people, believers or not, who are considering the realities of our sexuality. So he's an academic, teaches at a university. But he maintains, he's a marriage family therapist and maintains a practice only focused on teenagers. He sits down with high school students and helps them process things about their sexuality. And thirdly, he's an elder at his church. And I just go, when you put all of that packaging together, <clears throat> there are multiple people I know who do one of those things, but not all three. And it makes Mark very uniquely qualified to talk about this reality that many of us have developed and just live in a stereotype. And one of the things that Mark shared as he walked it out that was so helpful to me, he said, when I sit down with a high school student and we begin talking about their same-sex attraction, he's like, you gotta know that for most every one of them, they wish to God this wasn't the way they felt or who they were attracted to. This isn't about a political power trying to ram something in your face. This is about a broken image bearer who's trying to sort their way out. How am I supposed to live with this? How am I supposed to live through this with a culture that is screaming like this? And yet God from his word often is just this little whisper over here. And man, hearing Mark a couple times really helped me process some things so that when I would sit across from someone in my office who was working through same-sex attraction, it gave me the right kind of empathy, it gave me the right kind of compassion, it gave me the right kind of perspective so we could have a conversation rather than me seeing the thing that I see most often when I think about same-sex attracted people in our culture. And so I just wanna encourage you, if that's where you're at, if that's how you're processing this type of living against God's design, I want you to know it's no bigger sin than all the other sins we looked at last week that are outside of God's design for our sexuality. But I'd also want you to know that there are real people who really are working through things and wanting to honor God. They're trying to figure out how to do that. Pastor Kurt and I filmed an episode of Tangible Takeaways. I told you about it last week. It became available online on YouTube on Wednesday morning. And in our conversation about singleness and celibacy, one of the things that we talked about was, well, then what then for the same sex attracted person? Are, are they, because that's their attraction, are they free to pursue a same sex relationship, free to pursue marriage, et cetera? We talked about it and we realized that like that list was last week of counterfeits, anything aside from God's design either needs to be aligned to his design or I need to live in such a way that I don't just go, well, that's who I'm attracted to. That's where I'm going to go. Our culture screams that. God's word would say different. And so we talked about the decision, and this is so important. I, this has been a guiding principle for me at some of my lowest times. But I absolutely believe in every situation in which we find ourselves, there is an opportunity to honor God. There is a way through in this dilemma, there is a way through in these circumstances to say, God, what would be your best for the way I'm supposed to respond right now? And when it comes to the same sex attracted person, it would be God, like so many other people that are not in the covenant of a husband and a wife and a lifelong marriage, then what that must mean for me is singleness and celibacy. And I got you, you got to know in our culture today, that is so offensive. I understand that. I'm not trying to offend. But what I'm trying to help us see is when we come back to God's design, that is his design for our sexuality. Anything else doesn't fit. And the reality is, is as we look back at scripture and we realize these are the things that we 
in our own flesh would want to live as, realize this has been the way that God has set it up for the last 2,000 years. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, that is idolatry. Because of these, and note, the wrath of God is coming. As we looked in the Romans passage, there are always consequences for when we live outside of God's design. But look at verse seven. You used to walk in these ways in the life which you once lived. I loved last week when we looked at 1 Corinthians 7, or 6, I'm sorry. And these are what some of you were but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been purified. We'll finish out, by the way, this is not where the story ends. Back to Romans 1, verse 28. Furthermore, building on this case, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, here's the third, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. Another word for that word depraved is rejected. So that they do do what ought not to be done, And listen to the list. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. I totally think of my kids when I get to that line. Um, And the next one too, they disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. You guys, what doesn't fit under that umbrella? This is what happens when we live outside of God's design. All of these realities of living aside from his design with our sexuality, but then it plays into everything else of what we're about. Verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death, They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. When I see the world and I see its decay, I just tell you, I constantly remind myself of Romans 1. God told us this is what would happen when we rejected God from his rightful place in our lives. So I wanna finish today, how does God redeem what is so broken? Number three in your notes, our brokenness as tarnished image bearers can be redeemed in Jesus. Our image, our brokenness as tarnished image bearers can be redeemed in Jesus. Romans 5, a verse, a passage that we looked at a few weeks ago about how sin and death entered the world. We go back to that, Romans 5, 18. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, So also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. This passage is talking about what the Bible calls the first Adam and the second Adam, the original man in the garden, and now Jesus has come. And what we see in the obedience of Jesus is we see that he came to earth with a mission of walking to the cross. Don't ever confuse the crucifixion as though people got Jesus when he wasn't looking, that he was forcibly arrested. Jesus instead offered himself up. And it's his obedience of going to the cross that creates a way, though sin entered the world through the first Adam, righteousness, the way to be right with God, entered the world through the second because of what he did at the cross and the empty tomb for you and me. But I want you to see something as we wrap up our time today. I want you to see not just how Jesus was obedient all the way to the cross and at his death. I want you to see also his obedience in all of his life. Because we would say Jesus' ability to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin came because he was the spotless lamb of God, completely sinless. And that's, that enabled him. He was eligible to offer his life. I could die for you and it wouldn't matter. One sinner for another. But Jesus, the spotless lamb of God, could offer himself once, like the book of Hebrews says, for all. But I want you to note something that as we look at the sinless life of Jesus in your notes, what can we learn about God's intent for our sexuality from Jesus's 
sexuality. What can we learn about our sexuality from Jesus' sexuality? Now, at the beginning today, when I combine the words holy and sexuality, already those were two words you're like, mm, those don't go together. That's a weird. But Jesus and sexuality, all the more. Like those are two words that do not go together. And I wanna help you understand why your gut reaction is to think that way. The first is this is that when and we were talking about a little bit as pastors this week and realize, yeah, we rarely think of the idea of sexuality related to the person of Christ. And maybe the biggest reason is, as we read the gospel accounts of Jesus's life, we know that he was never involved sexually with a woman. So therefore, we don't know that Jesus has much to demonstrate, to be an example to us about sexuality. Watch, because we think sexuality relates to sexual behavior. But we established in week one, sexuality is an innate part of every human being, whether they will ever be involved sexually or not. So therefore, Jesus had a sexuality, though he was never involved sexually with anyone. But the other reason is this, is that when we think of Jesus as the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, often we think little about the humanity. Often in our minds, if we're honest, we think that Jesus was kind of pretending to be one of us and not taking on the full breadth of all that it was to be human. But if, if this is true, Hebrews chapter two, listen to this passage, for this reason, he had to be made like them, watch, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. That passage is telling us that Jesus could not be the atoning sacrifice for sin if he wasn't first blameless and without sin. But here's the thing, if you take that passage then literally, then what you have to process is that Jesus in his being had all of the sexual organs that any other man does. Jesus had testosterone pumping through his veins. Watch this, Jesus went through puberty, <clears throat> right? Jesus was a 13 year old at some point. And the reality is, is that's what it means for Jesus to be made fully human in every way. He was not pretending to be one of us. He fully walked in our shoes. And I gotta tell you, that should be so incredibly encouraging. Encouraging that Jesus knows and understands. And this wasn't, by the way, just at his incarnation taking on flesh. It actually extends to all eternity. Todd Wilson in his book, Mere Sexuality, says this, when the son chose a Y chromosome and embraced human flesh, he did so forever, never to take it off or hang it up like an old worn out coat. Our humanity, including our sexual difference, has become an intrinsic part of who God the son is, watch, and who God the son will be forever. This is, this is what it meant for Jesus to become one of us. His resurrected body is the body he will inhabit for all eternity. And so this all happened when he said, I'm going to come and offer my life. Now, two things as we wrap up that ring true from this. We know that he lived a life that was completely fulfilled, completely content, though he never experienced sex. His identity as a man was not tied to any sexual experience. It's powerful for us because our culture screams you're not complete until, you're not truly a man or a woman until you've been involved sexually. Todd Wilson again says this, we learn that sexual activity isn't essential to human flourishing or personal fulfillment. Jesus found contentment with his sexuality in the pursuit of the two things we talked about last week, chastity and celibacy. To be blunt, he didn't need sex. Not because sex is sinful or somehow beneath his dignity, but because sex isn't essential to being human. Man, talk about countercultural. Sex isn't essential to being human. But I want you to know how we finish is so powerful today. Not only 
was Jesus then fully human and went through these realities like us, but he was also tempted. Though he didn't give in, he was tempted sexually. I'll show you what I mean. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. What doesn't fit under the umbrella? Tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That being true, look what verse 16 says. Let us then approach God's throne of grace. How? With confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Man, you guys, this should leave you so encouraged today. Jesus doesn't live in an ivory tower looking down and going, man, it must be hard to be human or just the opposite. I don't know what y'all's problem is. Jesus walked it. Jesus was tempted in every way like you are, yet without sin. And what does that cause him? It doesn't cause him to be, so you guys have a problem, get with it. It causes him to say, so come boldly. Come with confidence because I know you need mercy and I know you need grace and I'm happy to give it. He has walked in our shoes, he understands, and he's happy to help us where we lack. Man, that, you should walk away going, God, thank you that Jesus gets it. This week, would you walk away realizing that God has made you as a human being an image bearer of him, broken as you may be, and God is in the process of redeeming. When you've placed your faith in Christ, redeeming what is out of alignment, redeeming what isn't reflecting him well, so that you can be the image bearer he designed you to be. Let me pray. <clears throat> Father, we're so glad and so grateful for your word. When I think of people today living in all kinds of different ways, I don't think it's always so rebellious. I just think it's unfounded. There's no moorings, there's no foundation upon which to understand truth. So just do what feels good, do what makes sense. And so Father, I'm so grateful for your word because it gives us moorings, it gives us a foundation, it gives us a design to know that this is how we are to live. And when we do, we experience your favor and your blessing. And when we don't, we experience your correction and judgment. So God, help us. Help us keep seeing the value of what you have given us and the truth that you've revealed so we don't have to keep living according to lies. You may be here today and you would say, Todd, that's how I've been living my life not just in terms of my sexuality, but the whole, I have been living according to lies and it has gotten me nowhere. So though God created everything perfect originally, sin entered into the world and you were born in it, would you A, admit? Admit that you're a sinner who needs a savior. Would you B, believe? Believe that Jesus is the only savior available because he was the God man. He lived perfect sinlessly all the way to the cross and provided the atoning sacrifice you needed. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Would you see, choose. Choose to say today, Jesus, I put my trust, my confidence in who you are. I wanna live my life following your example, Jesus, and dwelt by your spirit so that I can live a life that honors you. You can make that decision today. I pray you wouldn't let another day go by. Father, thank you so much for your incredible kindness to us. Help us live bearing your image this week. We pray in the great name of Jesus, amen.